D-Day at Omaha Beach, designed by John Butterfield and published by Decision Games, allows players to simulate the 1st and 29th US Division's landings at Omaha Beach on the 6th of June 1944. Now, it is essentially a solitaire game. The player controls the US forces while the game system uh, manages German actions and responses. However, the rules include allowances to make this a two-play game where each player controls a division on different sectors of the beach, east and west, and they cooperate to defeat the Germans. Now that essentially makes it a two-player cooperative simultaneous solitaire game. Uh, There's not really a lot of interaction between the two divisions. I haven't tried a two-player, but I think it it could be quite fun to share that alongside uh, a, a friend. Now the map, as you can see, is very colourful and, in my opinion, brilliant. As I've said elsewhere, I think it's one of the um, most interesting maps I've ever seen. Uh, yet I've read elsewhere that people hate it. Uh, I don't think it's great uh, graphically, but great in the sense that there is so much detail involved, so well thought out and designed, uh, and this level of detail facilitates a great deal of consideration in planning the US offensive. Uh, it may be ugly and appear confusing, but it is highly functional uh, and the detail is, is simple to understand and alluring and as mentioned elsewhere, it's the type of map, map you could study for hours just considering the many different paths that your units can take uh, and you get to know it quite well and get to know um, where the viable paths forward are. Now at the top of the map is a series of boxes. Now this is an abbreviated sequence of play flowchart. You simply follow the boxes from left to right, carrying out the actions as instructed. At first glance, the map may appear confusing and complex, so there are many dots, symbols, colours, shapes uh, and lines throughout. However, the rules guiding these are relatively straightforward, uh, and I found D-Day at Omaha Beach to be one of the easy games to get straight into. Uh, Now, this is all relative, of course, but all these symbols are easily understood, and hopefully by the end of this session you'll, um, you'll understand most of it. Now, the structure of the scenarios also helps new players to get into the game. You can start with the, the easy fox scenario to understand the basics and slowly progress to larger and more difficult scenarios. At one point, uh, one small point, sorry, uh, north is actually in the direction of the player and the beaches. Thus, east is on the left and west is on the right, whereas south is straight ahead. Now, once the basics are understood, the units in the game also appear very clear and functional. Now, each unit has a unit designation, mainly for reference and historical purposes, a step indicator showing how many more hits are left before the unit is eliminated, a unit type, the symbol in the middle, reflecting uh, the capabilities of the unit. Uh, infantry do most of the hard work, whilst tanks and artillery come in for support at times. Uh, a unit strength, indicating how powerful the unit is against German defensive positions. The material carried, abbreviated, this indicates basically what items that unit can bring to bear against German defences, and a reference symbol which is used for various in-game play uh, purposes, mainly um, allocating hits. There's also a range um, indicating on some units indicating how far that unit can fire. Now units without a range indicator have a range of one. They can shoot, attack into adjacent hexes. Now... At the point in the, my game where, I, where I'll pick up from in this um, this example, it is turn 6, 7.30am. Now, turns are divided into 15-minute blocks during turns 1 to 16, and 30-minute blocks from turns 17 to 32 once the US forces reach high ground. Now, this division, turns 1 to 16 and turns 17 to 32, also reflects changes that take place in the rules in the game. Um... And what I'm going to focus on here is just the rules from turns 1 to 16. Okay, so what's happened so far? The first division on the east or left side of the map has suffered some early losses. There are two uh, full strength units that have been eliminated. Uh, You can see this in the box on the bottom left of my map, which I'll show in a moment. Um, But I'm pressing on with the attack. Now, if you suffer eight full strength losses, the invasion of Omaha Beach is called off and you instantly lose. Now, my plan here is to focus mainly on the German strong points called uh, Bitterstand Nests, uh, abbreviated to WN throughout the game, uh, in the centre of the beach. These are primarily the, the two hex green Bitterstand Nests and the one hex orange Bitterstand Nest. Now, hopefully, my plan is to eliminate uh, the threat from these and then, then fan out through that space um, left and right. Now, the great difficulty with D-Day at Omaha Beach is that you are generally only allowed two actions per sector per turn. 
Now, fortunately, there are a range of other free actions you can take, and the presence of a hero, headquarters, or a general will um, later in the game help you with those free actions and get your units moving along more quickly, um, allowing you to coordinate larger attacks. And the first phase is a US amphibious operations phase. Uh, it involves drawing a card from the deck. Uh, there's only one deck in the game, and the information used in each phase of the game is available on every card. Uh, so drawing one card and applying its landing outcomes to US units in the landing boxes. The card is placed in the appropriate box labelled East Sector landing check card, and the landing information at the top is cross-referenced with the amphibious landing tables, as you can see here. Now, in this turn, I only have the, the one unit landing in landing box FG3, um, shown here at the bottom of the map, and it has a, a triangle landing symbol, which is circled in red. So I cross-reference that triangle symbol with the landing card to get a result of D shown on the card. Now the asterisk on the far right indicates a mine explosion could possibly occur, but these are not possible until turn 7, so I don't need to worry about this for this turn. With the result of D, I, I consult the landing table, I scroll down to the turn 4 to 14 section as it's turn 6, and I cross-reference my artillery unit with column D to get a result of no effect. So my artillery unit advances from its landing box into the corresponding beach hex, as shown. Uh, note that there is a stacking limit of two units regardless of size or strength. I then move on the west, the right hand side of the map to deal with the 29th Division's landings. Now they've only suffered one full strength loss thus far, which you can see in the bottom left. Uh, and an event has seen a hero arise in a forward unit. Now heroes, as I said, allow free actions and they're a huge benefit to your advance. As with the 1st Division in the East, I again draw a card for the 29th Division landing check and I consult the landing area, which is circled in blue. Fortunately, the 29th Division have both a headquarters and a general landing this turn. Now, both of those provide free actions to all units they are stacked with or adjacent, and adjacent to. So last time I placed these units in landing boxes so as, as to take full advantage of them when they land. Uh, these units do not have to make landing checks, so they jump straight into their matching beach checks, uh, as shown here. Uh, notice how I've tried to place them near my tanks and artillery to allow those units to move up the beach for free under their command in future. Once again, I consult the amphibious landing tables, conducted individual checks for each of my units to land. Uh, to summarise, my ranges on the far right with a diamond column A, turn 4 to 14, had a no result. My infantry unit with heavy weapons, uh, M3116 with a triangle column B, turn 4 to, 4 and C, 4 to 14, section drifting one box east. Um, and my artillery unit had a result of delayed, placed three turns ahead on the turn track, so I just did that. Now with all units landed for the turn, I take all units currently in the turn six turn box up the top, and I place them in their corresponding locations, which are shown on the counters. Uh, units are either given a specific landing box, for example FG3, or a range, so FG or EF or ER, within which you are free to place as, as you see fit. Now, turn six, my landings of the first division have all, all have the range of ER circled in red, meaning I can place them in any ER landing box. And I choose to keep them relatively close, but not stacked together. But as, I, as you've seen, landing checks will likely mess with my plans and send them up and down the beach. Okay, phase two is the events phase. And this involves, again, drawing a card, placing it in the event box, and following the instructions. Now, in this case, it is not good news. Um, more German reinforcements, and most of these event cards are. Uh, there are different types of reinforcements, but they follow the same general rules. As you can see, uh, the events on the card differ based on what turn you're in. In this case, turn six, I place a German unit in zone E, as close to a US unit as possible. And if tied for locations, I pick the lowest numbered position. As the image shows, there are two E-zone reinforcements closest to my US, US units. Uh, reinforcement positions are non bittersand nest positions with a coloured band around them marked with the letter of their zone. And you can see E1 and E4 are equidistant from my unit with the hero. So in this case, I pick the lowered number space, E1, and I place a German reinforcement unit there, as you can see, just above the E1. 
Now the third phase is the German fire phase, and this is the nasty phase of the game. Uh, I hold my breath as the Germans fire across my units trying to land. The first thing I do here is I draw a German fire card for the east sector. The results, circled in red, indicate that orange, green and brown German positions will fire. Now the double layered orange and brown symbols are a, a bit of a relief, they mean that only double stacked German units will fire, that is German positions with only one unit in their hex will not fire. The star on the green symbol indicates that headquarters and generals may be hit by this fire, um, they're otherwise immune. And the A and the F indicate additional German actions that can be ignored until turn 17 to 32, the second phase of the game. Now the diamond on the right indicates the type of US units that are vulnerable to fire this turn, as we'll see. Each German position can fire within a, a view arc represented by the different types of dots on the map. Now, brown German position, for example, fires into hexes where brown dots appear. An orange position fires into hexes containing orange dots around the area and so forth. And this simply represents what that position can see, units in that position can see. Additionally, within this view arc, the map represents different fire strengths. Uh, generally, hexes right in front of a German position are more dangerous than those out to the side or obscured. And, and this is reflected in the map by those different types of dots. So we resolve orange first in this card for simplicity, and this is where we begin to understand more about the map. Now there are three types of fire zones. A solid circle indicates intensive fire, very dangerous areas, priority one, it's a dangerous place to be. A sort of crisscrossed semi-solid circle indicates steady fire, priority two, and is generally a risky place to be. And an empty circle with a solid border indicates sporadic fire, priority three, and is the safest of the three, and a reasonably safe place to be, generally speaking. And from a given fire source, orange in this case, we follow the priorities down with US units taking hits until the fire source has reached its maximum. Now the maximum hits a fire source, or a hex can give, is indicated by the number of units or chits in that source. So a single German unit firing can normally only hit one US unit. A German unit with a depth marker, that is two units high, can hit two US units, while a two hex German Wittestand nest position, and there are several along the beach, can hold uh, up to four German units, two per hex, and potentially hit up to four US units when they fire. In this case, the orange position contains a German Wittestand nest unit. You can see below it a WN depth marker for an effective firing strength of two, meaning it can hit up to two US units. So priority one is intensive fire, the solid circle zone, so we check all those first. And looking at the map, we can see two US units sitting vulnerable in two intensive fire zones. Now I've marked uh, the three different fire zones on the map for your information and those two target areas circled in red. They're priority one, they're hit first. Now consulting the German fire chart, we can see that any US unit caught in this zone will take a hit. So in this case, both infantry units caught in that zone instantly take a step loss, after which, uh, as you can see below, they're weaker and they carry less weapons. In short, a full strength unit will carry a wide array of material, bazookas, radios, mortars and so forth. As they take losses, some of this material is also lost or, or left behind. Uh, what material a unit has left is, uh, when reduced is indicated by those two letter abbreviations in the bottom right of the counter. Uh, for, from six items, a full strength unit will go down to three when reduced. Now, the unit on the left, circled in red, now only carries demolitions, mortar and a machine gun. Okay, moving along, the two hex green Vitistan nest position uh, has had one hex disrupted by uh, previous fire, uh, meaning it cannot fire this turn. This is explained more in detail in a moment. However, whilst one hex is disrupted, the other is not disrupted. It can still fire, and it does so with um, deadly results. Uh, it is a two hex unit. It is a Vitistan nest de defender with a depth marker, so it can hit two US units. Uh, note that that disrupted unit doesn't block line of sight or anything, you just follow the, the dots. So a review of priority one intensive fire zones indicates two US units in those zones. The 7-2, uh, the H2-16 unit down the bottom carrying heavy weapons takes a hit, but the unit to its left already took a hit from orange, so is ignored. Uh, US units take a maximum of one hit per turn. Moving on then to priority two. 
steady fire zone shows a few US uh, units occupying Green's field of fire. And with steady fire zones, we consult the German fire chart and see that only US units with a symbol matching that on the card are hit. Now the card, you might remember, remember showed a diamond. So the nearby US unit with a diamond takes a hit, and this is circled in red. Uh, note that the stronger US unit in the middle with a black circle around it does not take a hit as its symbol is circle and doesn't match the diamond on the card. Uh, finally, brown German positions also fire, but none are currently occupied in the east, so this is ignored with some relief. Uh, next we follow the same procedure over in the west with the 29th division. Fire card is drawn for the west sector, indicating orange, red double stacked, and blue German positions will fire. Orange fires first, and whilst part of the two hex orange position is disrupted and can't fire, the other part, containing one unit, not stacked, um, can still fire. This means that one US unit can possibly be hit. Priority one first, and the adjacent US unit with the hero takes a step loss because it's in a priority one zone. Uh, red next, and the two German units here mean two US units can be hit. A US unit in an intense fire hex is easily hit, and then another US unit in a steady fire hex with a circle symbol matching the circle on the fire card also takes a hit. Uh, blue fires next, and it eliminates a ranger in the far west, which I haven't illustrated. Now the black bar at the bottom of the fire card indicates that German artillery also fires this turn. This doesn't happen too often. Uh, quickly reading this information, it means that if there are three or more German artillery units in the sector matching that type of artillery, then a US unit will take a hit, and there's a priority for that. In my case, there are more than three, so another US unit takes a hit, which I haven't illustrated. Phase four is the US engineer phase. Uh, the next, this, this involves engineers clearing beach obstacles in both sectors. Uh, there is not a lot of decision making here. You simply place a cleared marker in a beach hex that cannot be fired on by German units activated to fire that turn. Uh, they usually cover uh, most of the beach and there are generally only two to four available hexes to choose from. Now, with a view to opening up gaps for units to arrive safely in future, um, when landing, basically if they hit an uncleared hex, when a landing check indicates a mine explosion, then they take a hit. So I try to open up a wider gap in the east to allow those units to move through that clear area, whilst in the west, in the west sorry, no hexes are available to be cleared. Phase five is the US action phase, and this is, this is my opportunity to get things done. This is the most interesting phase of the game. As noted before, I get two actions per sector, in addition to a range of free actions. Now, to make things easier, when I move a unit, I, I tend to rotate it just 45 degrees. Um, the game comes with some action taken tokens, but I think it's much easier just to rotate them quickly and then rotate them back at the end of the turn. Now during turns 1 to 16, units can only move one hex. In turns 17 to 32, they may be able to move further depending on the terrain. Over in the east, I make a heap of, of basically free actions to get the infantry further up the beach. It is a free action to move an infantry one hex closer to a protective hex side. Uh, this is basically somewhere where they're less likely to be shot. Now for my two actions, I use one action on the far left to order a unit to climb a bluff, and there's no image for that. And for the other action, I order a full strength infantry unit to cross the shingle to get a better shot next turn at that German green Wittestand nest position. Now essentially the map features a range of different terrain types. There are different effects uh, amongst which are defensive modifiers for the Germans. If I attack solely across a shingle hex side, the top German unit's strength is doubled. However, if at least one unit is attacking across a normal hex side, such as where that circled red unit is, then this bonus is cancelled. That's why I've made this move. Whenever you move from a hex adjacent to a German position to another hex, also adjacent to that position, you need to check for infiltration. And this basically involves drawing a card and checking if the German position's colour comes up and if the, unit, if the moving unit's symbol also comes up. Now, if both of those appear on the card, then that moving unit takes a step loss. Now, the exception to this is if the German unit is disrupted, which it is in this case. Now, if that German unit I was moving adjacent to was not disrupted, I'd simply draw a card and check to see if green and a diamond were on there. If it was, that unit would take a hit. Over in the west, the US 29th Division headquarters allows all units stacked with and adjacent to it to move for free. So a large group moves together up the beach. A hero leads his unit for free in an assault on an orange um, German Wittestand nest position, 
In the previous turn they assaulted and removed the depth marker. Now they easily outgun and outnumber the position. Now to work this out formally, we consult the US attack results chart shown here. Uh, it's a pretty simple flowchart spreadsheet that you follow and cross-reference. Now German defenders will have material required by US attackers to defeat them, which appears in the bottom left of those German counters, um, shown in the black circle here. Now you almost always need your US attackers to contain those weapons to defeat that unit. In this case, the German defenders require attackers to have BR, or a Browning Automatic Rifle. As you can see on my unit on the right there, I have MO, Mortars, BG Bangalores, and BR Brownings. So I have the required rep uh, weapons. Consulting the, the chart, my strength is at least double. It's four to one, and it's a German unit alone, giving a result of German defeated, and thus the German unit is removed from the map. I use one of my West Sector act actions to launch another attack on a Wittestein Nest position. I reveal the top German unit to see what I'm facing, and it's not good. My unit has BZ, DE, and BR, but I need BG to defeat the Germans. So I'll have to call upon other nearby units in a future turn to help defeat that position. So, so far I've only used uh, one of my two actions. The other moves and attacks were all free. My hero and his unit were valuable. Um, but I'm concerned that they're in a, vul uh, a vulnerable position now. They're in an intense fire zone in front of a strong orange Vitastan nest. So I decide to try to barrage that nest with one of my tanks. Now, most infantry units have a range of one, and armor artillery have an extended fire range. Now, this is helpful as, as tanks in particular can barrage German defensive positions from a distance. Now to do this, I select a tank unit, armored unit, in the field of fire of a German position. Uh, I'm attacking the orange position, and the tank is in the steady fire range of orange. I check that the German position is within range of the tank, uh, which is the, the second number on that armoured chip, circled in blue, and then I draw a card and consult the US barrage table for results. Now in my case, with a tank strength of 4, which is the number to the left of that range in the tank, and with a card showing the German unit's symbol, but not the colour, I get a result indicating the German unit is disrupted, and this means they won't fire on my hero next turn, which is exactly the result I wanted here. With that done, I remove all cards played for that turn and put them in the discard pile. Uh, the turn track indicates on turn 6 that I should shuffle the deck, so I do this to get a new full draw pile ready for turn 7, and my continued assault on the Germans. Now hopefully that's covered the basic flow of the game and given you an idea of what actually happens in a turn. If anything sounds confusing, then it's probably my fault. The game comes with a, a range of charts and tables, but you get to learn most of these fairly quickly. Um, the barrage table comes pretty quickly, the German fire table, you know what happens, and the US fire table, they're all pretty easy to remember. Uh, the landing table is the one that you pretty much constantly have to cross-reference. Uh, the planning that takes place is a mix of sort of long-term hoping for the best, realising that units will get hit up pretty bad and, and suffer casualties and be sent several hexes down the beach by the landing chart, um, thus making... You have to make the best of the situation that unfolds. So you can sort of plan to take a certain defensive position, but if your units get shot up or moved along the way, you may decide to bypass that and press further inland instead. The game really sets you up to sort of roll with the punches and adjust to the situation that unfolds to be flexible in your approach. You may focus heavily on a specific Vitus in this position, only to find that you then need a rare naval barrage marker to destroy it. Uh, they become available through certain event cards. You'll then have to sort of change your plans to move your units elsewhere. Now, having said this, it's also important to plan for those sort of circumstances. Some defensive positions require artillery or heavy weapons to defeat. And if you fail sort of to plan that and have sort of left your artillery way back at the end of the beach, you may have some difficulties. As for those concerns about the map, hopefully uh, you get an idea that it's, it's pretty straightforward to understand. All those little dots represent the fire arcs from those German positions, and they're, they're easily understood after just a few minutes of play. And my main sort of hesitation in buying this was a concern about replayability. I was assured by others that this wasn't a problem at all. And after eight years, I'm still playing this. It is highly replayable. Um, and I highly recommend it.